Hey everybody, welcome to week one of PS398. So here we are. This is very strange, but this is how I teach. You'll get used to strange things as we go here. So, so welcome to the class. Uh, so, so for some of you that didn't bother to look at the syllabus or anything, this is our first interaction. That's great. Hi, I'm Rob. Um, I'll be your professor. You know, I don't want to get that much into what the class is about because you'll see what the class is about here in week one more than anything else. Uh, I can talk to you about class procedure and how this is all going to go, but you know, you're watching this movie, you have a problem set in front of you, you're smart, you'll, you'll figure it out. And if not, you can ask all the questions that you want to, but I, I just assume that, that you not know what we're talking about until you sort of come to see what it is that we're talking about. And you're like, oh, I'm going to drop this class. Thanks for making that so easy for me. You're welcome. So, so this is a class about international relations, that much you know. What you might not know is that this is a class about how to think in a particular principled way about international relations. This is as much a class about the method of thinking about international relations as it is about the substance of international relations itself. And so uh, that presents special challenges, uh, pedagogical challenges, just straight up academic challenges like, oh, this is a hard class. You know, you're going to have some challenges on the learning side. I have challenges on the teaching side. And so let's just get through this together. I think that you'll see that the best way to learn how to think in this principled way is to be forced to do it. And that's the way that the class is designed. Inherent in our approach is the fact that international relations is a really complicated topic. And you're like, oh, I needed a class for that. Shut up. So international relations is really complicated. There's a lot of countries. I haven't looked it up lately, but there's many. I'm going to go on the record and say there's many countries and they are interested in many more things. There are many issues. There are many dimensions that countries care about. They might be economic dimensions. They might be political dimensions. They might be ideological or religious dimensions. They might be all, there's all sorts of different dimensions that countries care about. And there's all sorts of different ways that they interact. Sometimes they fight wars with one another. Sometimes they trade with one another. Sometimes they threaten. Sometimes they make alliances. Sometimes they issue sanctions. There's a lot of things that countries do to one another. So there's a lot of countries and they care about a lot of things and they have a lot of different ways to interact with one another. Okay. And if we're going to be able to have some understanding of that, then we need a way to keep ourselves organized because there isn't a principled way to keep track of all these things. That's just, I, I, can, I can't speak for you. I can only speak for myself. I can't keep track of more than three things at a time. Right now I'm making a movie, drinking some tea, and I don't know, it's nice to have one extra slot open just in case somebody calls or texts or something, right? But beyond that, if you asked me to keep track of one more country, I couldn't, okay? Now you're smarter, you're not as, you're not as old as I am, so, so you're fine. You don't need a method for thinking, you don't think, and you're not right about that. You need a method for thinking in a principled way about all the different countries, all the different things that they care about, and all the different ways that they interact with one another. I believe that the best tool for that particular job lies in mathematics. Okay. So, so in order for us to be able to, to take the world and all of its complexity, all of the humiliation that we feel when we look at it, just, just one time, just go on the internet, go to some map, go to Google map or something, and just look at the, look at the world. Just look at it. Zoom out. Look at all the countries. Look at all the continents. Look at how many countries are connected to one another. Look at which ones aren't. Try to visualize which countries speak similar languages, which ones have histories with one another, which ones have former colonial ties. Then, after you've done all this high-level stuff, zoom in to just part of Siberia. And you're like, oh my god, the that is huge in its own right, and there's nothing there. It's too big. We need something to keep track of it. What's nice about mathematical machinery is that it scales. If, if you allow it to, it, it makes it easy for us to think about a particular interaction or some small level interaction. And then as soon as we've thought hard about it, we can think which properties of a small level interaction, like two countries bargaining with one another or something, which properties of that interaction are things that scale? Could I think about any two pair of countries? Could I think about three countries, four countries, dot, 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 all the countries? There's a lot of different countries. Not all the interactions are two-way. Not all the interactions are n-way. Somewhere in between two countries interacting and all the countries interacting are three, four, five, six, dot, dot, dot. So how do you scale? How do you know when bilateral bargaining, the lessons that you learn from bilateral bargaining apply to trilateral bargaining or quadrilateral bargaining? I'm just making words up as we go here. You'll get used to that a lot. 
And so the way that I want you to think about today's lecture, which is basically just about how to get some of the language under the fingertips, is today's lecture is a lecture in how to encode the world. How do we create statements that are meaningful and context-free? How do we create pristine logical claims that we have some faith that the claims that we deduce, our conclusions, are guaranteed to be true so long as our assumptions, our premises are true? How do we go from premise to conclusion, from premise to conclusion? How do we go from axiom to big, important lesson? What's the way that we get there? We get there through encoding the world into some object that we can operate on. The world itself is too big. The world itself is way too big. In order for us to make any sense of the world, we have to convert it to an object that we can work on, okay? We generally refer to that as a model, game theoretic models or other sorts of models. There's all sorts of different mathematical models, but what they all have in common is the fact that we took something big and humiliating and complex and converted it, encoded it into something that we can operate on. Now, for the 14 weeks after today, we'll be talking about how to operate on particular objects. But today we need to talk about what the act of encoding looks like itself. And it turns out that the way that we're going to talk about this is in three parts today. We're going to talk about what is a claim? What is a way for me to communicate something to you? You're like, what are you doing right now? It's a good question. But how do you know that the way that I'm communicating to you right now is precise enough, is sufficiently well encoded, is abstract enough, is context free enough, is indexicality less enough? You'll see. How do you know that the thing that I'm saying to you right now is precise enough that we could form a reliable language of international relations based on statements like this one? You don't. So we're gonna have to talk a little bit about what a statement is. What is it for me to talk to you? What is a sentence, okay? What is a sentence about international relations? What is a meaningful claim about international relations? What sets of words count as meaningful claims in international relations? What utterances are good utterances and what utterances are bad utter utterances? That said, all we will have talked about at that point in time is what a sentence is. We won't have to talk, we won't have yet talked about what a sentence does. What is a sentence about, right? So then we'll have to talk about what are the things that we get to talk meaningfully about? What are the objects in our theory? How do we construct meaningful sentences about something. What are the things that we get to construct meaningful sentences about? You're like, what is all this random talking? To me? I swear to God, I don't have vernix aphasia or anything. This is what we're going to be talking about today. You don't realize it just yet. You'll see. So what is it that we get to talk about? How do I talk about all the countries? How do I talk about all of the commodities? How do I talk about all the available actions? How do I talk about the different strategies? How do I talk about different preferences over different things? What are the things that I get to talk about? What are we talking about when we talk about international relations? I swear, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit insane, but I'm not that insane. You'll see. And then once we've gotten to that, then we'll say, well, now that we have objects that we get to talk about, now that we have nouns, what are the verbs? How do I relate different nouns to one another? How do I take one kind of thing? How do I take a country and assign it some other thing? Like what's its capital city or what's its GDP? How do I relate one set of things to another set of things? Okay. These three actions, forming sentences about things and then relating those things to one another are the backbone of encoding the world, are the backbone of having a precise, coherent, principled way to think about the humiliating complexity that is international relations. So let's do it. So in the A block, we'll talk about basic predicate logic and we'll mostly be worried about statements and how to combine them. What is a claim? What is a sentence? How do I take one sentence and turn it into another sentence? How do I take two sentences and turn them into some new sentence related to the original two sentences? How do I combine sentences in a meaningful way? You're like, I see you combining sentences right now, but it doesn't seem very meaningful to me right now, fat man. Point well taken, you'll see. In the B block, we'll talk about sets, the very basics of sets. All, almost all mathematical theory is based on the theory of sets. What is it to collect a bunch of things into one object that is the collection of the things that we were just collecting? How do I take one Yeti, two Yeti, three Yeti, and talk about the set of all Yetis? Is that the plural? What's the plural of Yetis? Somebody look that up. Look it up! What is the plural of Yetis? 
I bet you it's Yeti. You want to bet? You want to bet? Because I have not looked it up. And and you're like, could we just talk about international relations? Just shut up. It's, this is this is my YouTube channel. I get to do what I want here. So we're gonna look up what is the plural of Yetis. The plural of Yeti is Yetis, according to Grammar Monster, which I don't know if that's a reputable source, but I'm a little bit scared to tell the monster that it's not one. So how do we take one Yeti, two Yeti, three Yeti, red Yeti, blue Yeti, and talk about the set of all Yetis? What is it to combine? What is it to collect? What is it to take a bunch of things and put them into one place? That's what sets are there for. Sets allow us to meaningfully talk about the collection of all things that have something in common. And then the C block will talk about how to take one set and relate it to another set through something called a function. What a function is, you probably think you know what a function is, and, and maybe you do. A function isn't just f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 2. It isn't just a formula. What a function is, is it's a rule for taking one set of things, yetis, and another set of things, the possible liquids that one could put into a yeti, and saying, well, if I, the, the thing that is currently in this Yeti is hot honey lemon water, right? How do I know what's in this Yeti? How do I meaningfully say to you what's in this Yeti? You're like, oh my God, what's happening? Just, just be cool, just be cool. You're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine and you'll see that with some mix of what's about to happen and the problem set, you're capable of way more than you ever realized. By the time that we're done with today and maybe the first few weeks, you're gonna find yourself frustrated with how imprecise you've been up to this point. You're gonna say, how did I let myself talk so loosely about these really important matters in international relations? How did I allow myself to have so much conceptual slippage? Why didn't I put my own feet to the fire and say, hey, I need to get this right. Everything in international relations is important enough that it's worth getting right. And in fact, the act of getting things right is almost as important as the act of learning them in the first place. So, you might not realize it, but this foundational lecture is, this is what sets the tone for not just the, the substance of what we're talking about, but also what it is for the method to be substance itself. I'm really looking forward to showing some of this stuff to you, so I'm gonna stop bloviating. Let's get started. All right, so here in the A block, the first thing that I want to talk about is what is a statement and how do I use the tools of basic elementary logic to combine statements with one another? So first things first, what's a statement? What does it mean for me to try to communicate something to you in a meaningful way? And in particular, how can it be so precise? How can the claim that I make be specific enough that it's something useful if you didn't have the context associated with the current conversation, quote unquote, that we're having with one another? Okay, which is to say, could you take the sentences that you're making and then program a computer to understand them? Computers aren't great at context just yet, give them time. So a statement is a, an utterance or a claim. I'm begging the question like crazy, okay? I'm not, we're not gonna get, this is just enough for, for our purposes. It's a claim, it's an utterance, it's a sentence, it's a linguistic sentence. A statement is a, is a sentence, look at me, boom, 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 okay? It's a sentence that is unambiguously true or false, but not both. What do I mean by that? I mean that a sentence is a claim that is either true or false, but not both, not neither. If I say something to you like, so suppose that I just rocked up to you, right? And I'm like, go line eye! Man, that was cathartic. Kind of felt like Christian Bale Batman. Where is she? So, so if I say something like that to you, that's not a, sen that's not a, a statement. Why is that not a statement? Well, if that's neither true nor false, okay. If I say go Illini to you, that is neither true nor false. That's just a set of words that has nothing to do with trying to, to make a claim. I'm not making a claim. I'm I'm exclaiming something, okay. I'm saying go, go Illini. Now I feel like underplaying everything after my little catharsis moment. Now I'm just like, oh, go Illini, go Illini. I feel like Jeff Goldblum. Ah, uh, ah, uh, go Illini. That's the world's worst Jeff Goldblum impression. The question about whether go Illini is true or false doesn't even sound well posed, right? You couldn't even have an argument about that. So if, if I said go Illini, and then one of you said, oh, I think that's true, and the other one of you said that's false, does that make any sense to you? That doesn't make any sense to me. I, that doesn't make it, a lot of things don't make sense to me, but I'm pretty sure that that doesn't make sense to anybody, okay? 
However, let's say that I said to you, the Illini are awesome. The Illini are awesome. Okay. Now, that's something that is potentially evaluatable to true or false. That is, you could imagine somebody thinking that that, like, if I said to you, the Illini are awesome, and then one of you said, yeah, I agree with Rob, and another of you said, no, I don't agree with Rob. Well, now, that's better posed than go Illini. However, the fact that I could imagine there being two factions, one of which will agree with me that the Illini are awesome, and one of which disagrees with me and feels that the Illini are not awesome, right? The fact that there's a potential argument about that means that that isn't a well-posed statement either. So we, it has to be true or false, but it must be in, unambiguous. The context must not matter. And it can't be something judgmenty, like, like, I think the Illini are awesome. I think that the sky is beautiful. I think that this is fun to talk to you this way. So statements must be unambiguously true or false. And that's why definitions are really important. Something either lives up to a definition or it does not. So for example, if I said to you that the United States is a democracy, right? Now that's starting to sound like I are. Don't worry, I'll be back to the Illini soon enough. So if I say to you, the United States is a democracy, now, there's a lot of arguments about that. What mean, What does democracy mean? Good luck with that. What is democracy? How do I know a democracy when I see one? What is the formal criterion that tells me when something is a democracy and when it is not? In the absence of such a formal criterion, it's impossible for me to issue a statement that is unambiguously true or false, that has nothing to do with my own judgments, and everything to do with the formal criterion that I've created. Now look, I can use the formal criterion subjectively. I can say I define a democracy as any country that I happen to be in right now. But at that point in time, now we're bickering about the definitions rather than whether or not something is a democracy living up to the definition in question. Now we're fighting about what is the proper definition of a democracy, which is an argument that we've been having for at least 3,000 years with one another. Okay, but then once we've issued a formal criterion, once we've said a democracy is a system where people vote, the government leaders are chosen by the people voting, and there's, you know, maybe there's a couple other criteria. Once we've listed all those formal criteria in the form of a definition, now there is no ambiguity about whether something is a democracy or is not a democracy. Okay. So if I said to you instead, the United States is a democracy where a democracy is a country with a polity score of seven or greater. The polity score is like some range that goes from minus 10 to 10. So then all that we would do is look up. We, would, we could go to a database that has all the polity scores and look up to see whether or not each country, the United States in particular, has a polity score of seven or greater. And if it does, then the sentence, the United States is a democracy is true. Otherwise, the sentence, the United States is a democracy is false. It is one or the other, not both, not neither. Okay, a big goal for me in this class is to get you speaking primarily in logical statements. Okay, one way for us to have meaningful dialogue with one another, by which I mean arguments, one way for us to argue with one another in a productive, meaningful way is to speak in terms of statements. Now, fighting about definitions, that's that's murky, That's that's but that's also a really important part of any discipline is fighting about the appropriate definitions. But conditional on some set of definitions, what gets to count as a something and doesn't get to count as a something. Once we pin that down, then we can have meaningful conversations with one another, which is what we're looking for. This is just a language. This is just a language. Notice that I have my first logical operator. A logical operator is something that reads in a statement or maybe multiple statements. The United States is a democracy. Rob is a professor. You are a student. How do we take a bunch of sentences and make other sentences out of them? We use something called an operator. An operator reads in a statement or multiple statements and it spits out a statement, okay? So if I say to you, the United States is a democracy, that could be true or false, not both, not neither. That's a statement. One important way that I could <clears throat> make a new statement out of that statement is to use the not operator. The not operator says whatever the truth value of that is, true or false, but not both, flip it. Okay, so in particular, the statement, the United States is a democracy, could be negated. I could use the not operator and come up with a new statement, the United States is not a democracy. Remarkably, anytime the United States is a democracy is true, 
the United States is not a democracy is false. And every time the statement the United States is a democracy is false, the statement the United States is not a democracy is true. So all that does is it takes however you would evaluate the statement. If it spits out a true, give me a false. If it spits out a false, give me a true. Even though the plain language sentences themselves don't necessarily have anything going on like that. I have other ways I can combine statements, okay? But they're going to require multiple statements this time. So suppose that I have two statements. The United States is a democracy and Canada is a democracy. So now I've got two statements. I'm going to call those, we'll call that P sub U and P sub C. P sub U means the, the proposition for the United States and P sub C means the proposition for Canada. Now let's say that I wanted to take these two individual sentences, these two individual statements, the United States is a democracy, Canada is a democracy. I have two separate statements, two separate statements. I would like to link them and make a new statement that depends on the individual truthiness of the component statements, right? So right now I've got one statement, the United States is a democracy, that's true or false, but not both and not neither. I've got another statement, Canada is a democracy. That's true or false, but not ne but not both and not neither. I've got two statements. How do I combine them into other statements where that are either true or false, but not neither, and more importantly, where I know whether or not my new statement is true or false, depending on what I know about the individual statements themselves. Well, think about what you do in plain language. How do you link statements in plain language? pause the video if you need to. Let's say that you have two sentences and you want to link them. How do you do that? Pause the video. When I say pause the video, I mean pause the video. Hit K. Thank you. Welcome back. Well, here's an operator. It's called the AND operator. And you're like, for this I'm paying. Yes, for this you are paying. How to get AND just right. Well, suppose that I took the claim, the United States is democracy, and the claim Canada's democracy, and suppose I link them with the word AND. Now I've got a new statement, and the statement reads, the United States is democracy, and Canada is a democracy. AND, AND. Now, when is that true? When is that new statement that I just made true? When would I be right? That's right. So I would be right if both of the individual statements were true. The claim the United States is a democracy and Canada is a democracy is true only when the United States is a democracy, full stop. P sub U is true. And Canada's a democracy. P sub C is true. So if I have a true here and a true here, then I get to have a true here. Otherwise, I've got a false. Now, how many different ways are there for that? There's three different ways. It could be that the first claim is false and the second claim is true. It could be that the first claim is true and the second claim is false. Or it could be that they're both false. No matter what, in any of those three contingencies, my new statement is false. My new statement is only true if each of the individual statements was true. Okay? But now I've got a third sentence. I took two sentences and I made a third one out of it. You're like, well, and seems like a pretty harsh criterion. How about or? Well, that's another operator, the or operator. Let me keep these two statements the same. The United States is a democracy. Canada is a democracy. P sub U and P sub C. These are the same inputs. These are the inputs. These are the inputs of my operator. All right. So here they are. I've got these two sentences and now I, 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 I bring them down and I link them with the word or. How, you, how are you going to get anything right if you can't get your sentences right? If you can't say a sentence right, if you don't understand what's happening in a sentence, how the hell are you going to understand what's happening in a country? How the hell are you going to understand the international system? How the hell are you going to understand once the aliens come, what interplanetary politics are going to look like? If you can't even get your sentences right. So now I've got the word or in between these two things. Okay. Well, 
When is that true? Under what conditions about my original statements is my new statement true? When am I right and when am I wrong? Pause the video. That's right. I need at least one of them to be true. Okay? So let's suppose that both P sub U and P sub C were true. Suppose they were both true. Suppose the United States is a democracy is true and Canada is a democracy is true. Suppose they're both true. Well, if that's the case, then my new statement, the United States is a democracy or Canada is a democracy, that's also true. Notice that or allows or both to be true. When you think about it, that's kind of ambiguous because sometimes if I say to you or, sometimes when I say or, I mean one or the other, but not both. And sometimes I mean or both. In math, or always means or both. Okay, so if I say to the United States a democracy or Canada's a democracy, what I'm saying to you is either one of them is a democracy or both. Okay, so if I have a true and a true, I've got a true. If I have a true and a false, I've got a true. If I've got a false and I've got a true, then I've got a true. All I need is one of them. I don't need all, I don't need both. I just need one of them. The only time that I'm wrong in my new sentence is if the United States is not a democracy and Canada is not a democracy. If I've got a false and a false, then I've got a false. Notice that that's not the same with and. And was, the only time I had a true is if I had two trues. Or is, I get a true so long as I have at least one true. So now we've got three different ways to make a new statement out of an old statement or multiple statements. Not, which is to flip the switch, and, and or. Okay, and, or, and not. Those are pretty intuitive, right? You, I don't know about you, but I've said and many times today. And that was before I started recording. I've said not many times today. I've said or many times today. You use these words, these words come up. Now we have a precise meaning. And means true only if the component statements are both true. Or means at least one is true or both is true. And not just means flip that switch on a well-posed statement. But none of these, even though we just made new statements, none of these new statements uh, can like convey new meaning. I'm not generating a new knowledge. I'm just taking statements and I'm making other statements. I can take some verbiage and convert it to other verbiage by using linkage verbiage. How do I take knowledge and make new knowledge out of it? What would that mean? What does it mean to take some knowledge that you have and turn it into other knowledge in the in, 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 in statement form? Well, the way that we do that is with the word if. Logical implication. So for example, let me just make two new claims, okay? Just the, so suppose that, that, that claim one is a country has a country is a democracy. Suppose, suppose that I have P sub X, which is country X is a democracy. P sub X, country X is a democracy. And suppose I have Q sub X, country X has elections. Okay. So, so here are two things. Country, country X is a democracy. Country X has elections. All right. So now I've got two, I've got two statements again. I'm going to show you how if then works. So, the way that if then works, if country X is a democracy, then country X has elections. Now I've linked these two claims into a third sentence, putting an if and a then, all right? If P is true, then Q is true. When is this claim true? That's hard, that's harder, right? So I've got four different combinations of true and false values for, for my two initial claims, right? It could be true, true. It could be true, false. It could be false, true. It could be false, false. In which of those four contingencies is my new statement true? And in which of those contingencies is it false? You can pause the video if you want to. Welcome back. So here's, here's the way to think about this. You can think about this if then as a promise. Under what conditions do you think that I've broken my promise? If I've broken my promise to you, if I break the promise of this claim, then give me false, otherwise it's true, okay? So if, if country X is a democracy, then country X has elections. 
When is that true? Well, I would need to see a country that's a democracy that has elections. That's true. I didn't break any promises. I kept my promise. I said to you, I'm going to show you a country that is a democracy. And then you'll notice that it's also it also has elections. And most people would say, to be a democracy, you have to have elections. So, so true, true. What if it was true, false? What if country X was a democracy and it didn't have elections? Would my statement be true or would I have broken a promise to you? That's right, I would have broken a promise. So if I said to you, if country X is democracy, then it will have elections. And then you see a country that's a democracy that doesn't have elections. Then my statement is false. I broke a promise to you. If there was some magical democracy that didn't have any elections, then my claim would have been false. Okay, I would have been wrong. A lot of this is about knowing when you're right and knowing when you're wrong. Now suppose that country X wasn't a democracy. And irrespective of whether they had any elections, would I have broken my promise to you? No, I didn't break any promises because I wasn't put to the test. So if I say to you, if country X is democracy, then it will have elections. And then you see the country X isn't a democracy. Then what I said hasn't been tested. I haven't broken a promise to you. Think about it this way. If I said to you, if you work hard in this class, then you'll get a good grade. And then you didn't work hard. And then you got a bad grade or a good grade. Who cares? Would, I, would my claim about the relationship between work and grades, would I have been proved wrong? No, because you didn't work hard. All right? We call that vacuously true. So my, my if-then statement is vacuously true anytime the premise is false. So if the premise is false, if the first part of the if-then claim is false, if this is a democracy, if you didn't study hard, then my if-then claim is true. I didn't fail any tests, I didn't break any promises, all right? So in other words, the way that this if-then thing works is it's true if both claims are true or if the first claim is false. The only time if-then is wrong is if the premise is true and the conclusion is false. That means we failed a test. That means we broke a promise. This verbiage might help you to see what we mean when we say necessary and sufficient conditions. If I say to you, if a country has, if a country is a democracy, then it will have elections. Then what I'm saying to you is that democracy is a sufficient condition for having elections. It's not just a sufficient condition in general, it's a sufficient condition for another sentence to be true. If I tell you that one thing is true, then that's sufficient for you to know that another thing is true. So, so P in this claim is sufficient for Q, and Q is necessary for P. Any time, what, any time that P is true, so too is Q in this world. So that's implication, that's if then, that's our fourth way of taking two st statements and making another statement out of it, right? You give me one statement, you get another statement, and then I can begin to evaluate whether there are credible claims that I can make. Patterns of truth. What are patterns of truth in international relations? How would I know them when I saw them? I'd be looking for implications like this, okay? I'd be looking for if then. Now there's something even stronger. If then is just implication. If and only if is equivalence. This is our fifth way of linking two statements is if and only if, okay? So suppose that we were again talking about country X and my claim was country X is a democracy if and only if country X has elections. Now when I say that, I mean P implies Q. If P is true, then Q is also true. And I also mean Q implies P. So if I say if and only if, throughout the class, if I say if and only if, I mean the two claims are actually fully equivalent. Anytime one is true, so too is the other. And anytime one is false, so too is the other. The vacuous part gets washed away. So in this particular example, I would need it to be the case that every time a country was a democracy, so too did it have elections. And every time a country had elections, so too was it a democracy. The first part is true. All democracies have elections. That's a necessary condition for democracy is having an election. However, having an election is not sufficient for having a democracy. 
There's all sorts of dictatorships and other authoritarian regimes where elections are held. They might be sham elections or they might not. However, what I mean to say is the mere fact that you know that a country had an election does not mean that you get to reliably infer that it's a democracy. So that if and only if claim is false. Country, country X is a democracy if and only if it has elections is false. One way of implication is true. If country X is a democracy, then it has elections. That's true. But if country X has, has elections, that does not imply. I can find countries where it is true that there were elections, but it is false that it's a democracy. We, we can all think about examples. We, I mean, so as a notable example, Adolf Hitler was, was democratically elected. Nazi Germany was not a democracy. And in fact, for you to prove that an implication claim is false, all you need to do is find one example, one example where the premise is true, but the conclusion is false. Nazi Germany is sufficient for me to have disproved my claim. So that's if and only if. So now I've got five different ways. I've got and, or, not, if then, if and only if. It's five different ways to take statements and make other statements out of them. And then with if, then, and if, and only if, these are ways for me to meaningfully convey new knowledge to you. To say, if you knew that one statement was true, you would also get to know that another statement was true. Two more ways. These are called quantification techniques. So suppose that I had a bunch of countries. Suppose that I had all these different countries. Okay. And suppose for every country, I had the statement, country X is a democracy. Is this country a democracy? 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 So for every one of these countries, I have, is that country a democracy? Right? I went, I've got their polity score. I can tell you which ones had seven or greater. Those are democracies. I'll put them in blue. Whee! And then I had all the countries that had six or less on their polity score, and I'll put them in orange. These are the non-democracies. So here's all these countries. Some of them are democracies, some of them are not democracies. Now suppose that I said to you the following. For all countries, country X is a democracy. So maybe for all countries in the United Nations, country X is a democracy. That's a new statement. I just made a new statement that's either true or false. Right? I just made a new statement that's either true or false, except it's not just based on two statements now. Now it's based on all these. Now, when would I be right and when would I be wrong? When is my statements for all countries in the United Nations, country X, for all countries X, country X is a democracy? Well, I would need to see all blue. That means I'm right. What would it take for me to be wrong? Would they all have to be non-democracies? No. In order for my claim to be false, if I said to you, for all countries X in the United Nations, country X is a democracy, for you to say, no, Rob, you're wrong, all you would have to do is come up with one country that wasn't a democracy. Right? So you'd say, oh, sorry, North Korea is a country. Ergo, you are wrong. And then we can have a conversation. So to negate a for all, I don't have to say another for all. All I have to do is come up with one example. There's another quantifier called there exists. So suppose I still had all the countries. So suppose I said the following to you. There exists a country in the United Nations that is not a democracy. There exists a country that is not a democracy. That's a statement. That's either true or false, but not both. Let's not go Illini. That evaluates the true or false. And it's not both. Context doesn't matter. Individual judgment doesn't matter. Right? That's a, that's a, that's a well-formed statement. When is it true? When is that statement a true statement? There exists a country that is not a democracy. So for example, suppose that it was a 50-50 split. If it was a 50-50 split, democracies and non-democracies, and I said to you, there exists at least one country that's not a democracy, am I right? Yes. What if it was all the countries were non-democracies? Suppose that all the countries were non-democracies. Is my claim there exists at least one country that's not a democracy, is that true? Yes. Now suppose that I suppose that there was one country that was not a democracy. One and only one country in this whole set of countries that wasn't a democracy. Is my claim there exists at least one country that is not a democracy? Am I right? Yes. Now suppose all the countries were democracies. 
Am I right? No. So in order for me to be wrong with a there exists, I need a for all. And in order for me to be wrong with a for all, I need a there exists. So I can say that something is true for everything in some particular class, or I can say that something is true for at least one. Another one that comes up sometimes, I'm not gonna, I won't call it one of our big seven, is like there exists one and only one. There exists a unique country that is not a democracy. That isn't true. So if I said to you, there exists a country in the world that is not a democracy, that's true. If I said to you, there exists a country, there exists a unique country that is not, not a democracy, that isn't true because there are multiple countries that are not democracies. So seven ways to take statements and make other statements out of them. And, or, not, if then, if and only if, for all, and there exists. Those are the core building blocks. This is the language that we're gonna be talking throughout this class. This is the way that we will be talking, okay? You'll get used to it and you're not gonna to have to think about true and false every time. You'll see how this all goes together. Most of the time we're only gonna focus on true statements. You'll see that eventually you're gonna just start stringing these things together in relatively long paragraphs of logic. And it's all going to be in a relatively principled, easy to understand, highly encodable, context-free way. Okay, that's our language. Now, I've sort of used some examples about countries and democracies and studying and not studying and so on and so forth, but we haven't yet talked about how to take the things that we care about, like countries, and organize them. We haven't organized anything. All we've done is organize our language. We need to organize things. Let's talk about how to do that over in the B block. So I want to talk about sets here in this B block. I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that even for sets, um, statements are foundational. So we will be talking about sets using statements. I couldn't have talked about sets first and then statements, okay? Like statements are, are the way that we talk about sets and sets are the way that we talk about everything. What's a set? Well, I'm not going to be able to give you a formal definition because that's a PhD level thing in philosophy or mathematics or something, okay? For our purposes, a set is just a well-defined collection of objects called elements. The whole point of a set is it tells you, it's a, it's a bunch of things, like for this you're paying, and so it's a bunch of things, and when you know the set, you get to know which things are in the set and which things are not in the set. So suppose, for example, that I just said to you that I have the set of all countries, I'm gonna call it N, all right? N equals the set of all countries, okay? In the United Nations. All, all formally recognized countries in the United Nations. There's a set. We'll talk about how to write that down here in a second. But as of right now, there's a bunch of statements that you know. There's a bunch of statements that you know, okay? So for example, you know that the United States of America is an element of that set. In order for me to write that, I use this little weird little E symbol, element of. So if I write the United States of America, boom, my set N, that's my way of saying the United States of America is an element of the set of all countries, okay? That is a statement. That, can, that is either true or false, but not both. In this particular case, it's true. Now suppose that I said to you, Illinois is a member of the set of all countries recognized by the United Nations. That is false, right? This isn't a country, that's a, that's a, that's a subnational unit. That's not a United Nations sort of thing, right? Urbana is not a member of the set either. Rob is not a member of the set of all countries recognized by the United Nations, okay? So I can also tell you a bunch of things that are not elements of that set. I could negate the statement or I could just put a slash through the E and that means Urbana is not an element of the set of all countries recognized by the United Nations. The point of a set is it's a bunch it's it's a bunch of things collected in a sort of an abstract way that allows you to know what's in it and what is not in it. If I said to you the set of all students in this class, you're an element of that set for now. We'll see about a drop day. Right? So you're a member of that set. You're an element of that set. I'm not because I'm not a student in this class. Your friend that is not taking this class is not an element of the set of all students of this class. For that you're paying. 
So that's all that a set is. A set is just a way of being able to form meaningful sentences about whether or not something is a member of it. Now, whenever I write down a set, there are two primary ways for me to write down the elements of a set. I could just, I mean, I'm gonna use names like N or X or whatever, but actually, if I wanna actually dig deeper and say exactly what, not the name of the set, but what is the set itself. If I wanna write down the set, not the name of the set, but the set itself. Something and its name are not the same thing. That's an important lesson that everybody ought to learn in college that seems very obvious and actually isn't. The fact that you know the name of something doesn't mean you understand the first thing about it. And the fact that you understand something doesn't mean that you know exactly what to call it. Which is to say, knowing the name of something is neither necessary nor sufficient for understanding it. So suppose, for example, that I wanted to write out the set of all United Nations recognized countries that are on the continent we call North America. Suppose I wanted to write that out. Boy, that sounds hard. That sounds like a daunting task. That's, I have countries, I need to put them into a set. I need, what am I gonna do? I don't know how to do that. How do I do that? I do that with squiggly braces and I just write them out. So if I wanted to, if I wanted to write out a set of all countries recognized by the United Nations on the mainland continent of North America, I have to go squiggly brace. That's my way of announcing this is a set. That's just a notational convention. That doesn't make it any, that doesn't make it a set. That's just a way of conveying it to you. And I would write Canada. That's a country recognized by the United Nations on the mainland continent of North America. Boom, it's in there. It's an element of that set, Canada. The United States of America. That is a country recognized by the United Nations on the mainland of the continent we call North America. It's two. Mexico. Just shout them out as you get them. That's another one. That's a country recognized by the United Nations on the mainland of the continent we call North America. It's not that bad. Is that it? That's it. Right? So now I can close, I put the other squiggly brace. I have just written out the set of all countries recognized by the United Nations on the mainland of the continent we call North America. That would actually, that was the final test to get my PhD. Could I do that? This is called roster notation. Sometimes the easiest way to write out a set is just to write out all the elements. You know, for, a, for something with three elements, it's not very hard. And I could do that for all the countries in the United Nations. If I said to you, what's the set of all countries in the United Nations, I could just go, Pfft. you could just come out with a big giant list that was had squiggly braces at the front and the end, and that would be it. Okay, that's roster notation. I can also use roster notation even if the set's gonna keep going. So suppose that I wanted to talk about the counting numbers. One, two, three, four, five. There's more than that. It turns out that there's an infinite number of those because anytime you give me a counting number, I can come up with a new counting number. So suppose that you said, I have all of the counting numbers gathered in one set. One, two, three, four, five, that's your claim. That's all the counting numbers. I can say to you, I can come up with another counting number. Six, which is, I made that just by combining two of the elements of the set. So it turns out that one, two, three, four, five is not the set of all counting, that's infinite. However, I can still write out in roster notation what I mean, right? I can say to you, the set of all counting numbers is one, two, three, and so on. How would I write and so on? Dot, 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 ellipsis. So whenever I say to you, whenever I have that dot, 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 that means and so on and so forth, living up to the pattern just described. That could be one, two, three for the counting numbers. It could be two, four, six for the even numbers or one, three, five for the odd numbers. It could be one, one, two, three, five, eight for the Fibonacci numbers, right? And I can put a dot, dot, dot there. Or if I said to you, Alabama, dot, 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 Wyoming. If you're familiar with the geography of the United States, you could fill in the blanks and understand that in roster notation, I just wrote out the set of all 50 states in the United States. Sometimes it's a pain in the butt or it's just plain impossible to write out all of the elements of a set, even using the dot, dot, dot trick. In cases like that, I use something called set builder notation. So suppose I just wanted to talk logically about the set of all trade partners with Canada, right? I wanted the set of all countries that Canada exports to. Now suppose that I don't actually care about the particulars. Suppose that what I care about is the act of Canada exporting to you. So if I don't feel like looking it up, I can still gather all of the trade part. I can still gather all the export targets. I can gather them 
even if I don't look them up. I can just write out something that looks like this. Suppose that capital N is the set of all countries again. I'm going to use set builder notation, which comes in two chunks. So I'm going to have squigglies. Okay, I'm going to have a pipe in the middle. I have a pipe in the middle and two squigglies. I'm going to say the set of all export targets for Canada. In order to do that, on the, on the left side of the pipe, I'm going to specify what it is that I'm talking about. So I'll say maybe the set of all little x in n, the set of all, and I'm naming little x as arbitrary now. Now I'm saying I'm going to be talking about little x's over here on the other side. You'll see what I mean here in a second. So here it is. I'm talking about little x's, which are countries. By definition, I'm telling you, if I say x is in n, and n is the set of all countries, then you know that I'm talking about the set of all, I'm talking about a country. X is a country. X isn't a jazz singer. X isn't a dog. X isn't a professor. X is a country. That's the universe of discourse. In this particular set, it's a country. And then on the other side, I'll list the property that has to be true to get to be included in this set. I can use statements to define sets. I'll write the set of all X and N such that, the pipe means such that, such that, it is true that X is an export target of Canada. So every time that this statement is true, then the country X in question gets to be included as an element of the set. I didn't have to look anything up. I just gathered them all. I could gather all the countries. I could gather all the planets. Right now, I'll say to you, the set of all, I don't know, planets that are in the inhabitable zone from their respective star and that have liquid water and that have atmospheres or whatever. I could just, I just named a bunch of planets that are outside of my sensory experience. I don't have to see the country to be able to include it in a set. I care only about the properties that the, that the planet has. I don't need to know the planet itself. All I need to know are the properties about it. There are some well-known sets I want to talk about real fast, right? So, so the counting numbers are one of them. The, the symbol that we use for one, two, three, dot, 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 is this fancy, it's called a blackboard N. We call that N, that's the natural numbers, the counting numbers. We'll be talking a lot about the real numbers, R. All that is is the set of all the negative numbers, all the positive numbers, rational and irrational, zero, pi, one, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three, E, pi, the square root of two, every number that you can think of that isn't imaginary lives in R. And that's where we talk about numbers a lot in the class. Natural numbers, real numbers. There's an important set that we talk about pretty often called the empty set. You can imagine that that's just a set with no elements in it. So if I say to you, the empty set, and then I say to you, anything you can think of, this Yeti of hot honey lemon water is an element of the empty set. No matter what, that's false because nothing lives in the empty set, including this. My microphone doesn't live in the empty set. My chess set doesn't live in the empty set. It lives in the set of all chess sets. It lives in the set of all wooden objects that I own. It lives in the set of all recreational games in my house. It lives in the set of all things on my desk, but it does not live in the empty set. Finally, we'll talk pretty often about intervals, the set of all numbers that are less than or equal to one number and greater than or equal to another number, or just not greater than or equal to, just less than or, or greater than. So if I write in brackets, A, B, where A and B are two real numbers, maybe it's zero and one. So if I write zero, one, if I write zero, one, that means the set of all real numbers, the set of all X and R, such that, set building notation, X is greater than or equal to zero, and X is less than or equal to one. Whenever I use brackets, that means or equal to. If I wanted to talk about just greater than or less than, I would use parentheses. So if I write in parentheses, zero, one, that's the set of all numbers strictly greater than zero and strictly less than one. I find that it's better if I just sort of move a little bit quick here and then you can dig in on the problems and ask all the questions that you need to. Remember, you get to ask all the questions you want to. We're going to meet twice this week. We're going to have two meetings this week, each an hour and 15 minutes. You can get to work on your problem set during that time. Or you can ask me questions about what we're talking about right now. Okay? So those are some well-known sets. There's a bunch of other well-known sets. I won't bore you with all the details. The counting numbers and the real numbers are the ones that we use the most. Um, intervals, empty set. I want to talk about different ways to combine sets. 
right? So just the same way I can combine two statements, the United States is a democracy and Canada is a democracy, can I combine two sets? The easiest way for us to proceed with this is to begin to visualize a set. You should think about a set as a blob with thoughts in it. So whenever I write a set and I'm just doodling, if I'm just trying to think my way through something, I tend to just write sets as a blob with dots in them. It's just a good heuristic to get things started. So suppose I want to talk about the set of all countries in the Western Hemisphere, right? With at least some land in between the prime meridian and the international dateline on the Western side, west of Greenwich. So there's a set of countries. That's a blob with dots in it, right? The United Kingdom is in it. The United States is in it. Mexico's in it. Argentina's in it. Bolivia's in it. That's a blob with dots in it. There's just a bunch of dots. All the countries that are in the Western Hemisphere. Let me talk about another set. The set of all countries in the Eastern Hemisphere. That's a blob with dots in it. What's in there? China's in there. Russia's in there. Malaysia's in there. Australia's in there. England is in there. England is on both sides because the, 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 the prime meridian goes right through the United Kingdom. right? So the United Kingdom is in there. So now I've got two blobs with dots in them. How do I combine them to make a new blob with dots in it? Well, there's some, all of the ways really are related to what we were just talking about with statements. So suppose that I want to talk about the set of all countries that are in the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. And, and, we talked about and. What's the set of all countries that are in this set and in this set? It's a good question. How would I write that? The operator that I use is called the intersection. Okay, the set of all countries that are in the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. Is that the empty set? No, I know it's not the empty set because there exist countries that are in both the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. For example, the United Kingdom, right? The United Kingdom is east of the Prime Meridian and west of the Prime Meridian. Therefore, there exist countries that are both Eastern Hemisphere countries and Western Hemisphere countries, right? There exist little parts of the United Kingdom, like the city of Dover, that is in the Eastern Hemisphere. The United States is in both hemispheres because some of the Aleutian Islands goes just west enough to cross over the, the international date line. Okay? So, so a country can be in both hemispheres. It doesn't have to be. Right? Mexico is in one hemisphere. It's only in the Western Hemisphere. Poland is only in one hemisphere. It's in the Eastern Hemisphere. So if I want to talk about the set of all countries that are in the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere... That's the intersection. I write that with this little upside down U symbol. I could have used or just as easily. I could have said the set of all countries that are in the Eastern Hemisphere or the Western Hemisphere, right? Well, that's easy. East, east or West is easy because that's just the set of all countries. If I wanted to set, right? Every country is either in the Western Hemisphere or the Eastern Hemisphere or both, right? So that turns out to be the set of all countries. So that's all of these countries and all of these countries. It doesn't matter if a country is in there twice. Union doesn't give you like two copies. So the fact that the United Kingdom is in this set and this set, it only shows up once in the Union. Okay. But that's what I'm talking about. I could just say this all of these countries or these countries. That's what the, that's what the Union operator gets me. Union is or. The complement of a set is just the set of all objects that don't have a certain, that aren't in the set in question. So if I had the set of all Eastern Hemisphere countries, for example, if I had the set of all Eastern Hemisphere countries, then if I said that the complement of that set, that's the set of all countries that are not in the Eastern Hemisphere. So Mexico is in the complement. The United Kingdom is not, because even though it's in the Western Hemisphere, it's also in the Eastern Hemisphere. So that's like not, which means that and goes to intersection or goes to union and not goes to complement. There's a really important way to combine sets that isn't quite the, in, in this, in keeping with this, it's called the product of two sets. The product of two sets is really important because that's like the set of all combinations of two sets. So suppose that I had the set of all real numbers one way, zoom, I'll put them on a line. And suppose that I had the set of all real numbers another way, zoom, I'll put them on another line. So now I've got a two dimensional plane. I've got a plane, right? But what is this? What's a point in this plane that I just made? Well, this is the set of all pairs of numbers. So if I go right here, right? So that means that the first number, the horizontal number, the X number from high school algebra, right? 
That means I'm, I'm, I'm exactly here on that axis. And on this axis, I'm exactly this high. So if you give me any point in this plane with two numbers, I need two numbers, I can come up with this, I can tell you exactly where it is on this plane. The plane is the product of two individual real lines. It's the set of all possible combinations where the first number is a real number, negative seven, 11 billion, 12. And the second number is a real number, negative pi, the square root of two times a Google. It's just a set of all ordered pairs. An ordered pair is a, is a, is a bunch of different objects where the, the way that they come to you, the order of matters. So a set is defined only by what's in it, not the order that things are in it. So if I said to you, the set of all numbers, one, two, three, and then you said to me, the set of all numbers, three, two, one, even though they're in different orders, it's the same set because one is an element of both sets, two is an element of both sets, three is an element of both sets, and nothing else is an element of either set. They have the same elements. Two sets are the same if they have the same elements. It doesn't matter the order, it doesn't matter how many. Ordered pair, as you may have guessed from the name, the order matters. So if I said to you, I'm looking for the number three, two, is that the same as the number two, three? No, three, two is further to the right and lower. The order matters with these coordinates. The order of coordinates matters. The product is just a set of all possible pairs of coordinates. And I can just iterate that procedure as you'll see on the problem set. So unions, intersections, complements, and products. Those are the four main ways in this class that will take two sets and make another set. It could be that it's all in the same dimension. I have one set of countries, I have another set of countries. I intersect them to get another set of countries. I union them to get another set of countries. I complement to get another set of countries. Okay, so I went from one dimension and I kept the dimensionality the same. Product, on the other hand, creates a new dimension. The set of all numbers, the set of all numbers. The combination is the set of all possible numbers. The set of all pairs of numbers. Okay, I just added a new dimension. I went from a one-dimensional line and a one-dimensional line, and I combined them to make a two-dimensional plane. So whenever we want to say that something is a function of many different dimensions, what we mean is there's a bunch of sets that matter and I had to product them all. One last thing while we're talking about sets, uh, I want to talk about a subset. So if I say to you that one set is a subset of another set, let's say that I say that set A is the subset of set B. What that means is that everything is an A, that's an element of A is also an element of B. Right? So if I say the set of all democracies is a subset of the set of all countries, that's true. That's a statement. That's a true statement. Why is it a true statement? Well, consider anything that is a democracy. Right? I'm talking about countries with poverty scores. So they are countries. Right? So if something is a democracy, then it is a country. If then turns into the set of all democracies is a subset of the set of all countries. Is the set of all countries a subset of the set of all democracies? No. There exist countries that are not democracies. Therefore, these two sets are not equivalent. There's no if and only if relationship. It's an if then, not an if and only if. Ah, so actually all of the different things about statements can be made manifest in sets. We'll get practice with all this. I just, it's not, it's not that bad. It, it's easier than it sounds, you'll see. So now we have this nice language of sets. We have a well-specified collection of objects called elements, and a set tells us what gets to be included and what doesn't get to be included in a particular collection. The set of all things on my desk, the set of all countries whose name starts with Z, the set of all oceans, the set of all YouTube channels. There's a, there, you can just do it real fast. Now it's so big, it still isn't very meaningful, but at least you were able to gather it conceptually. Set of all real numbers, that's so big that you couldn't hope to, you can't understand the tiny, you can't understand the huge, you can't understand the magnitude of the number of things that live in the real line. Nevertheless, you can still gather all the elements. So we have a well-specified collection of objects and we know how to combine them in logically meaningful ways. The last thing that we need is about how to form conceptual linkages between two sets. We'll talk about that over in the C block.
So here in the C block, I want to talk about what a function is. A function is a way for us to relate one set to another set. So let, before we get too far into it, just think about the function as, as you probably got taught it up to this point. So you probably got taught that a function was a formula, right? So let's just say f of x equals x squared. f of x equals x squared, that's a function, right? So you got you, you know that function, you've seen it before. It's like a parabola, you've seen that, the graph of that function. What happens, what's happening with that? What's a function doing? What does a function do? Like, what does it do? How would you be able to tell two different functions from one another? How would you be able to say the two functions are the same? How would you be able to say that if I, I could take one function and slowly change it into another function? In order to do that, you have to have a sense about what a function is and what it does. So what a function does, f of x equals x squared, that reads in a number, right? You don't say, what is f of x equals x squared? And I say to you, hey, what is f of Rob? You're like, well, Rob squared. Oh God, now there's more. You don't want that to happen. No, it's not a well-posed claim. If I say to you something squared, that means numbers. It means real numbers, right? So it reads in a real number. It reads in one, two, three, or negative one, negative two. Pi, negative square root of two. A Google, negative a Google. It reads in a number. It reads in a number and it squares it. It multiplies it by itself. So it reads in zero and it spits out zero because zero times zero is zero. It reads in one and it spits out one because one times one is one. It reads in two and it spits out four because two times two is four. It reads in the negative square root of two and it spits out two because the negative square root of two times the negative square root of two is two. It reads in negative nine and it spits out 81 because negative nine times negative nine is 81. In other words, it reads in a number and it spits out a number. It takes one real number and it gives you another number. A function is just something that reads in the elements of one set, in this case R, the set of all real numbers, and it spits out the members of another set. In this case, R will do again, the set of all real numbers. We could actually whittle that down if we wanted to because I'm not sure if you noticed. Uh, all numbers, all real numbers, if you square them, you get a positive number, or a non-negative number anyway. So I could just say maybe it spits out the set of all real numbers greater than or equal to zero. What a function is, is it reads in the elements of one set and it takes it and it spits out the elements of another set. It's a bunch of arrows. A function is a bunch of arrows. Where it says, here's a dot, send it to another dot. Let me just give you a preview of coming attractions to show you that this isn't just numbers that we're talking about. So suppose, for example, that the set that we want to think about how happy I am as I consume different beverages. So let's suppose that the input of my function is Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite. Those are inputs, that's not numbers. I can't square a Coke. I can't come up with Coke squared, or Pepsi squared, or Sprite squared. Nevertheless, I can still come up with a function that does the same sort of thing where it reads in the elements of one set, Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, and it spits out the elements of another set. So let's just say that I had another set of, let's say I had the real numbers. Here's a here's thousand, here's zero, here's negative two, here's pi. I got a bunch of dots in here. So I could come up with a function that reads in elements of this set and spits out elements of this set. So for example, consider the function is the number of calories of in a 12 ounce can. Well, there's a rule, you could look it up. You could find a 12 ounce can of Coke and find out that maybe there's 100 calories. Maybe Pepsi has 120 calories. Maybe Sprite has 80 calories. Diet Coke has zero calories. So there's a function, there's a bunch of arrows where the dots on the first, where it reads in dots that are cans of a beverage and it spits out numbers that are how many calories are in that can. We could do the same with what does it cost at the mini mart closest to my house? the price function. Or we can talk about what we'll be talking about a lot next week, utility functions, where if I assign it a high number, if I say that I get five happiness points from consuming a Coke and four from consuming a Pepsi, that means I like Coke more than Pepsi. So there's another set of arrows. There are different functions with the same domain, the set of inputs, and the same codomain, the set of outputs. But that's all that a function is, is it's a way of taking one blob with dots in it and linking it to another blob with dots in it. 
The important thing, there are two rules of a function. When I say well-specified, the well-specified rule has to satisfy two rules, both of them. Otherwise, it's not a function. Rule one, every dot in the domain has to get sent to an arrow. It cannot be the case that if I say to you how many calories are in a can of RC Cola, you say undefined. In order for this to be a well-defined function, it has to be the case that every can of pop or other beverages gets sent some, to some calories. There exists some amount of calories that's relevant for every can of beverage. Two, it can only be one. It can't be the case that a can of Coke has both 100 calories and 200 calories. You don't get to go to multiple places. I'm gonna put a little knuckleball on your problem set just to make sure you're thinking that through on the international relations level, okay? So a function can go to one and only one dot, not zero, not two. It sends each dot to another dot. It doesn't have to send them to unique dots. It could be that a can of Coke has 100 calories and a can of Pepsi has 100 calories. They have the same number of calories, that's fine. That doesn't break anything. The only thing that breaks things is if any given dot in the domain gets sent to zero dots or multiple dots. It can only go to one dot. While we're here, I'll just show you. I can come up with functions that are special functions. So for example, if every dot in the domain gets sent to its own unique dot in the codomain, then it's called a one-to-one -one function. Each one dot goes to another one dot. One-to-one one -one relationship, unique relationship. Right? So if a can of Coke has 100 calories, a can of Pepsi has 110, and a can of Sprite has 120, then it's one-to-one -one because every can of pop is being set to one distinct, unique calorie number. And if everything in the codomain gets hit by at least one can, then it's called onto. It's called an onto function. Now in this case, it's going to be impossible for me to come up with an onto function because there's all of these different calorie values 114.972 repeating calories. There doesn't exist a can of pop with that many calories in it. So one-to-one -one and onto, those are special functions, but they're still functions, okay? So in order to be a function, all you have to do is take each dot and send it to one and only one dot over in the codomain. This is how we come up with conceptual relationships. Think about with cans of pop and, and numbers. Think about all the different conceptual functions that could link these two sets. Calories. Price, number of things that you've had in your life of each can of pop, utility points that you get out of it, uh, year that it was first created. There's all sorts of different numbers you can sign to a can of pop. They're all different conceptual things. There's different arrows that live in the middle, but they all serve the same structural purpose, which is to take cans of pop and spit out numbers. Which numbers? The numbers that live up to the concept that we're talking about. That's how you do it. Sets, functions, logic. All you have to do is be very organized. Follow certain rules. They're not even hard rules. All you have to do is make sure that you're living up to these rules. If you live up to the rules of statements, of sets, and of functions, you have a very good chance of not getting yourself ruined at step zero of your task of getting to wherever it is that you're going. If you're going to get there, you have to be principled, you have to be smart, you have to live by rules. So what do we talk about today? Well, we, we, today we didn't really talk about anything, and you're like, and yet I have a headache. Uh, <laughs> we talked about how to talk about things. We have 14 weeks after today to talk about international relations. And we're gonna talk a little bit longer about what it is to talk about international relations. In fact, today was just about how to talk about how to talk about international relations. I swear to God, that's a, that's a true statement. It's not even vacuously true, that's a true statement. Today's lecture was how to talk about how to talk about IR. And it, it, it might not be obvious to you um, because you're at the beginning of your journey. But these simple rules, these simple principles, which I have imperfectly showed you and we're gonna talk about throughout the class, these principles of structured, principled ways to talk about things, it's hard to describe, but once you start to get good at it, you'll never wanna go back. 
Okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love art. I love reading for fun. I love I love art. I, I love literature. I love poetry. I love all sorts of things that are not precise. Okay. But when I talk about IR, I want to be precise because it's way too important. It's way too humiliating. It's way too complex. But the stakes are so high. We have to get this right in ways that a poet doesn't. Right or wrong doesn't apply to a poet the same way it applies to an IR analyst. The question is, does there leave any room for artistry? Does there leave any room for creativity once we're living with these rules? And anybody that's played Minecraft or any other sim build, or like a, a sim builder can tell you there's all sorts of room for creativity even when you're constrained by living up to certain principles. That's what we're doing here. We are not artists, but we are not scientists. We are architects. We have to come up with ways to make sure that we build something beautiful, something elegant, something that leaves an impression on somebody that uses a building, but that stands. I would say that once we're talking about having to live up to certain rules, then the language of mathematics is almost a necessary step for us to talk about IR in a principled way. If we're going to live up to... To, to making sure that a building stands, we have no choice but to resort to some kind of mathematical thinking. And it's with the notion of mathematics in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. What is mathematics? Nobody quite knows. Um, for a long time, the definition of mathematics was it's the thing done by mathematicians. And that was said both glibly and not glibly. In the glib sense, you know math when you see it, just the same way that Justice Potter Stewart knew obscenity when he saw it. He couldn't come up with a formal definition of obscenity at the Supreme Court, but he knew obscenity when he saw it. And likewise, people didn't know what math was, but they knew it when they saw it because it was something the mathematicians were doing. So whatever it is that caught a mathematician's eye, that counts as math. That's very unsatisfying. Um, because mathematicians do all sorts of things that aren't math. For example, they eat lunch. Many mathematicians eat. And when they eat, they're not doing math. They're eating. So how do you know what things that mathematicians do are math and what things that mathematicians do are eating lunch. You need a better definition than math is what mathematicians do, right? But think about all the different things. There's geometry, there's analysis, there's topology, there's, there's discrete math, there's, there's calculus, there's, there's all these different parts of mathematics, right? And that's just in, in, in sort of pure math. There's all these different applications. There's computer science, there's engineering, there's game theory, right? There's all these different, what is, how do I, how do I know math when I see it? There's probability theory. That's like data. Now we're talking about data. What is math? What is math? What's math? Pause the video if you need to. What's math? My favorite definition comes from uh, Keith Devlin, whose book was, was mentioned on, on the syllabus. Like this conversation came up in the 70s and 80s in the immediate aftermath of the failures of the new math. And so one useful definition of mathematics is that it's the science of patterns. Probability is the science of patterns of chance. Calculus is the science of patterns of like little flow. Geometry is the study of patterns of shape. Topology is the study of patterns of place and closeness. Number theory is the science of patterns of counting. So if that's the case, then any time that we see some branch of mathematics or some area of ap application of mathematics, it's incumbent upon us to say it's the science of patterns of something. And so what is strategic international relations? It's the science of patterns of strategic interdependence among states at the global level or among other actors at the global level. It's the science of patterns of strategy applied at the global scale. That's what strategic international relations is. Well, now that we've defined what mathematics is, what does it do? What does math do? That's a provocative question. It helps you to see things that are invisible to you. Mathematics allows us to go beyond our five senses, right? So if you saw a large metal object moving at a very high speed, okay? So here's a, here's a, and it's moving at a very high speed. And then all of a sudden you see a couple little changes to the, you see a couple little different moves in this large metal object. And then once it reaches a certain speed, you notice that it's coming off the ground. This large metal object is what you might call an airplane. Now, 
Suppose that you didn't know it. You've never seen an airplane before. Suppose you're an alien. You just came down to Earth. And you've never seen an airplane before. And even though you're an alien that just came to Earth, suppose you don't know anything about technology. You're just sitting here watching. You're stupefied. You're transfixed by the miracle that just happened in front of you. Right? So here it comes. It's invisible to you. You can't sense. There's nothing obvious about what just happened. All you see is you see air. There's nothing underneath. What's happening? Now, if you were an aeronautical engineer, you'd, be, you'd know exactly what was happening. You would have different models. You would have probably some, some differential equation models that allow us to know about different concepts, abstract things like drag. And I've now run out of things I know about why planes fly, right? But there's different, drag doesn't, I, I, can't, I can't feel drag like, it, like, like an aeroplane involves. I can't see drag. Nevertheless, in the context of a mathematical model, I can talk about different patterns of airflow, different patterns of force, and next thing you know, it's not very hard for me to see and to rationalize and to explain why it is that this miraculous thing of a plane flying just happened. Math made an invisible thing visible to me. In the context of a mathematical model of flow and planes and all this sort of stuff, think back to your high school physics classes. Imagine a pulley. Imagine some block on top of a, of a ramp. Imagine some solid object at a certain temperature. Those are all just objects in a model that allow you to see something invisible. You wouldn't have been able to detect those things. You wouldn't have been able to detect the patterns. The science of patterns allows us to see things that were not obvious to us before. An interesting question then is what's invisible to us? If strategic international relations is the science of patterns of strategic interdependence among actors at the global scale, what is the invisible thing that it helps us to see? It's a good question. The answer is, I don't know. There's all sorts of different things. It could be patterns of regime type and how that relates to whether or not two countries fight one another, the democratic peace. The fact that I see two countries that don't fight one another, that are both democracies, as an empirical reality, it's true that democracies haven't fought. But in order for me to know that countries, democracies don't fight, I would have to see something invisible. I would have to know exactly why that is the case. I would need to understand the mechanism by which two democracies don't fight one another. Otherwise, I'm just guessing. I'm just speculating. I need to see something invisible to me. Otherwise, I can't make any arguments. Countries are too large, too humiliating, too complicated for me to be able to detect what it is that's happening. It's too much. I need math to be able to give me some patterns to simplify the process. So strategic international relations is the science of patterns of strategic interdependence at, at, among actors at the global scale oriented to help us to understand invisible processes, invisible strategic mechanisms that link different kinds of actors, countries, leaders, firms, rebel groups. I'm, I'm doing all this because I want to help to persuade you that this is an enterprise worth undertaking. It's week one. There are other things you could be doing with your time. And this isn't always going to be fun. And you're like, is it ever going to be fun? Yes, I think so anyway. But if you're going to get to where you're going, you're going to need principled ways to see invisible things. The last aspect about mathematics is maybe the most underappreciated for people like us who are sort of political science majors or people that sometimes interface with political science majors. People that are... Smart, we're, we're smart, you're smart, I'm smart-ish. People that are smart, but maybe not mathematicians. An interesting question is whether mathematics is discovered or invented. Is it all out there? Is math out there? If you believe in the Almighty, does the Almighty have the all-encompassing math textbook and it's our job to figure out what's on its pages? Or is mathematics something that we have invented to help us to serve certain purposes. There's a famous quote attributed to the great mathematician Leopold Kronecker, that God invented the integers and all else is the work of man. So in that sense, the act of counting things is sort of baked into our experience so much that a religious person like Kronecker might think that the act of counting is something that the Almighty gave us the ability to do. And so we need integers to be able to do counting, right? 
But then beyond that, to do calculus, to do probability, to do little partial differential equation modeling, to do topology, to do any of these things, to do matrix algebra. All of those are things that we've invented along the way. And generally we invent them for some purpose, unless we're doing very pure mathematics. So in a sense, math is discovered in the sense it has to follow certain rules, certain patterns emerge, and those patterns, it would, many people think, are, emerge for particular reasons, be they theological, be they epistemological, or whatever. But it's also invented in the sense we have problems that need solved, invisible things that need detected, and we need to invent new machines to help us to see those invisible things. So in that sense, mathematics is neither invented nor discovered, or both. The verb that I prefer for it is mathematics is designed. It's something that we are continually interacting with. It's a tool that we've developed that also needs to be updated based on the needs of its particular practitioners in any given moment. Now that adds an element of human agency to that. It means that if we're going to be involved in this enterprise of strategic international relations, the science of patterns of strategic interdependence among actors at the global scale, aimed at the task of understanding the mechanisms by which these actors interact. If we have any hope of understanding that, we need to design a branch of mathematics for ourselves to see those invisible processes. And so as we wrap up week one, think to yourself, what are the invisible things that I would like to see? And what machine would I design to help me to see them? Well, with that something that heavy on your mind, I might as well let you go. Thanks so much for being part of week one of this class. And more importantly, thanks for watching.